Before we get into the message today, we wanted to say a special hello to our extended family around the world. And we wanted to thank you for joining us. Whether you are watching from our River of Life Church app, Facebook, or YouTube channels, we're so thankful to be connected with you. Well, here we go. All right. So we live in a time, as you all know, that the decisions and the choices that we make are probably more important than ever before. I know in my lifetime as a 52 year old uh, young individual who will not let the old man in, I know that I have been faced with some decisions that have caused me to take a step back. And before I took that step back, I reacted. So Pastor Chris and Pastor Miriam talked about our response last week, did they not? How we respond to the issues and the circumstances of life that we're all going to face. So I was thinking like, Lord, you know, in the season that we're in, you know, is it just left up to the body of Christ the children of God, those that have been called by your name, when it comes to making decisions, that it should be like an individual with a dart in their hand and just throwing it at the dartboard. And although we're doing our level best to aim in on the bullseye, we really, in the end, just don't know where it's going to land. And of course, the Holy Spirit began to minister and said, no, I have a prescribed way. God has laid out a prescribed way in the word of God so that those of us that are called by his name. When we make decisions and when we make choices and when we make the moves of life. We can do it with confidence. With confidence, knowing that God's will will be done. Regardless of how society views that move. So for this message, I've titled it Bad Moves. Bad Moves. We can talk about the good moves of the Bible and those individuals that made those good moves and we can celebrate it. But this morning, I just want to highlight just a few individuals. And there are many that made a bad move. Say bad move. Now, before we go into judging them, because we have the word of God for our learning, so that we won't have to repeat what they did. But what I want you to invite you to do this morning is to think about the moves or the decisions that you're faced with at this present moment. I'm not talking about what, what clothes to wear or what shoes to wear or, or whether you're going to go to the Golden Corral after church. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about some major moves. Whether or not to get married, who to get married to, whether or not uh, to take a job, whether or not to leave this city, whether or not to get out of the military, whether to get the... or not... Is that the elephant in the room for some? But here's the deal. Regardless, you are faced with a decision. And I want to encourage you that God has an answer for you this morning. So if you could write down at least two moves, two decisions that you're faced with right now and keep it to yourself. You don't have to share it with your, your, your significant other to the left and right. This is your business. Now, if it's a corporate decision, then you can do that. But write that down if you would and keep that in mind. And for the rest of us, if we would go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13. And we're going to start off at verse 5 and read through verse 14. And it reads as follows. It says, then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand 
which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth Haven. And when the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, then the people hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of God and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, bring me a burnt offering and a peace offering here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed that the Philistines gathered together at McMash. And then I said, the Philistines will come down on me at Gilgal. And I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord, your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord has commanded you. So we see here, there's so much in this passage of scripture, but for the sake of time, we see that King Saul is in a situation. And if you go back and, and, and read the previous parts of this chapter, his son Jonathan has, has waged war or attacked a, a Philistine at a garrison. And he was successful at, at defeating them. And King Saul heard about it but there is something in this passage of scripture that's very uh, peculiar, very unique, because uh, King Saul took credit for what Jonathan, the success that Jonathan had. But now he finds himself in a situation where he has gathered together 3,000 men, and it, the scripture tell us that the Philistine army with the, the chariots and the and how many people they had it was an overwhelming force in which Saul and his army had no chance of defeating but the key thing here is that Saul had received some instructions from the Lord through the man of God and because of some situation and some circumstances he began to lean to his own understanding. And all of a sudden, because of the circumstances, he took it upon himself to do something that the Lord had prescribed only for the priest to do. So we see here that in life, when we're faced with a decision, such as a decision that you may be faced with this morning. Maybe you have expected God up to this point to give you an answer or to give you a solution that suits your comfort level. And you're starting to get a little anxious. You're starting to get a little uneasy because if we really dive into here, King Saul has a reason in the natural to be concerned with what he is seeing. Not only does he know that his enemies are many, but even the, the troops that he had put together begin to defect. 
Has anybody ever been in a situation when, when you had some friends or you had some family around you, but when things start getting a little uneasy, things start not going the way you had planned it to go, and people that told you they were with you or that they'd be there with you to the very end, all of a sudden they start coming up with some excuses. And really what you see is folks starting to to exit stage right and exit stage left. Have you ever been in that situation? Maybe you find yourself in that situation right now where those individuals that you thought were your friends, because of what you're facing right now, they're fading to the background. And you find yourself standing there all alone. I want to encourage you this morning that you're not alone. For those of us that are children in God, he said he'd never leave us, nor will he forsake us. So we see here that that King Saul is, 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 he's got a dilemma. But he's the king. He has a priest that's there. That's his responsibility to, to, to make these offerings. But all of a sudden, something creeps in. Like grandma used to say, King Saul's starting to smell himself. And he's thinking, well, guess what? Because I'm the king, because I am the king, and Samuel, the priest, has not come when he said he would come. And because of the situation and the circumstances, I can take matters into my own hands. That right there, that attitude, when we talk about atmospheres shifting, really it should say attitude shifting. Attitude shift now. (laughs) Chain be broken, break now. Holy Spirit, come now because my attitude is starting to drift off of the lane that you put me in. And my attitude is starting to drift off of putting my eyes on you and I'm focusing on the situation and the circumstances that I'm facing. So how many could say that you need an attitude shift? That the atmosphere is shifting. God is always willing and able and ready to shift the atmosphere. But it starts with us and our attitudes. So we see here that King Saul is walking in pride. Yes, there may be some fear there, but I really don't think it's about the fear because he he really understands that God is able to take 3,000 men or less and defeat a multitude, an army of a multitude. So there's something else in operation here. And see, pride says, if they can do it, so can I. Have you ever heard, know anybody, not you, but is it, whoa, 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 they can do it. I mean, how hard can it be? Some of you may be looking at me right up here now and judging me saying, well, how hard can it be? Just get up there and talk, right? Just get your little notes. <laughs> yeah, right. Hello, somebody. See, you can come up here because you think you can and because you, you know, maybe you, you think, you know, whatever. But if you come up here, you better be called. You better be chosen. You better be filled with the Holy Ghost. Because once you come up here on any platform, you're going to have to die to yourself. But here we have the king walking in pride. Walking in pride. Mm. God had had put in place a prescribed way of making offerings and who could do it and you know who we get in big big trouble you know you're getting ready to make a bad move and there are many examples i think about the home and how god has established authority within the local in the home but it's something about uh, around uh i don't know maybe 13 14 15 you know, that the kids start looking and saying, well, dad, if you can do it, I can do it too. Or mom, I mean, how hard can it be? And these judgments start coming because don't nobody know us better than our children. Can I get an amen right there? 
And see, we help that attitude because of our inconsistencies, right? We think we're behind closed doors whispering, get on my nerves, get on my nerves. And how many know them walls are thin? I know my walls are thin because my baby girl said, Daddy, you're snoring. You need one of them CPAP machines because you're just snoring, right? It's like you're in my room. We're going to do something about that. Yeah, they said, they said I had to have apnea, so we're going to do something about that. But anyway, that's the man of God is walking in pride, and he made a big, 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 uh, big uh, error. The scripture tells us in Proverbs 16 and 18, it said, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. Pride. Pride, that's something to really be aware of. And that when you're getting ready to make a decision or getting ready to make a move in life, you have to ask yourself, am I, do I have a posture or an attitude of humility? Or do I think I already know what is best? What is best? The second thing was unbelief. He was walking in unbelief because, see, he did not not only believe that the man of God, when he did not come, when he said he would come, but he did not believe there for a moment. He was walking in unbelief, and he really thought that defeating the Philistine army was up to him and the men that he had as his troops. He forgot about the fact that God could, he could call down a legion of angels if he wanted to. He could blink his eye. There's stories in the Bible where God had them destroy themselves, right? While the, while the children of Israel were breaking pots. So he, he's not really fully walking by faith. Yes, according to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11 and 12, it says, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, and that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So it is through faith and patience, say faith and patience, that we inherit the promises of God. The only problem there is we say we're walking in faith and, 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 and we're bombarded with the issues of life because we're seeing it in, this, in our senses are highlighting what's going on. So we begin to drift off into unbelief. And you know you're drifting off in unbelief when you use your mouth to say what's not going to happen, especially when that is contrary to what God said will happen. So if the man of God said he was going to come, then the king should have rested on the fact that he was going to come. And even if he did not come, God still was going to have the victory in the end. Romans 1, 16 through 17 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by, I said the just shall live by, so we don't walk by our sight, we walk by faith. So with the decisions that you wrote down, are you viewing it through in the eyes of faith? Because regardless of what you choose, you're going to have to trust God. And God does have a plan and a purpose and a promise for each and every one of us. So why not just trust him and walk in faith and patience? Every time I hear somebody say, oh, Lord, I pray for more patience. We we know the story. I begin to cringe because I used to say that a lot. But God's got a way of putting you in a situation where you have to be patient. Can I get an amen right there? See, some of y'all have been waiting to be married for about the last, you know, 40 years. Right. 
And you're still not married, right? But you're still in that holding pattern, that waiting pattern. Can I get amen? Oh, y'all are like, yeah, amen. Amen, brother. <laughs> but just wait on the Lord. What has he promised you? You can take him at his word. Don't be anxious for anything. Just wait on the Lord. Next thing he was operating when was impatience. Impatience, and we already tapped in that just a little bit, but he was impatient. That anxiousness. I, I, I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life when, when I wanted something so bad that, that my mind began to try to figure out and make these connections to how what was going on was tied in to, to what I wanted. See, in psychology, the study of the brain, they call that confirmation bias. See, because although we are children of God in the body of Christ, we're still human. Can I get an amen right there? So see, we have a way, this human anatomy has a way of functioning, and this brain is very complicated and complex. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know you want that car. You got your eyes set on that 2022 Mustang GT 5.0. No, 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 no. GT 500. Is it GT 500? GT 300? Well, we won't go that high. Let's say the Lexus 500. Ah, let's come on down to the Mustang GT 5.0. All of a sudden, you're seeing them everywhere. Right? You, you stop at the stoplight. Man, they go one. You go over to Michael's. Why? Now, all of a sudden, we begin to confirm in our mind that just because somebody else have one, that that one belongs to me too. So you're believing God and walking in faith so much so you go over to the Ford dealership. And you say, the Lord said that I can have what I say. If I say it and I believe it, I can have it and then receive it. So you go over there to the Ford dealership and because you're so spiritual, they got that whole row of Mustang GT. And there we drive by and you walking around them GT five, them GTs five, just seven times. You just walking around. And God is able to get you that Mustang GT if your motives are right. Amen. But as I say, if you have a Ford focused budget, right? <laughs> see, but confirmation bias will trip us up. And see, marketers, they take advantage of that. They take advantage of that. They have you fill out. Now, I'm not beating up on car salesmen because I got some that I love that are brothers in Christ that are doing the right thing and doing what's in the best interest of their clients and what's in the best interest of, of their business. But if you know this individual has a Ford Focus budget, why are you trying to put them in something that they can't afford? See, so commercials and marketers, they take advantage of the gaps that we have in our brain. And then they want you to test drive it, right? Get in there, because that new car smell, that just seals the deal, don't it? Bam! Oh. I was telling the folks in Purple Book, I was like, look, we were talking about money this past week in class 10, and we were asking, you know, can, should, we, should we desire to be rich as, as the children of God? And we had a nice little dialogue there. Um, but I tell you what, I've, I've been fortunate enough through some friends to drive a luxury vehicle. Can I get an amen right there? And I just want to let you know there is a difference between a luxury and, 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 and not. Yep. There's a difference. <laughs> I'm not going to mention no names, but it's something about a luxury car that's just special, right? Anyway, I don't know how we got on that. My point is there, there's something with the brain that, that, can, that can trip us up, right? And, 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 and all of a sudden, now we're beginning to get impatient in doing some things. In James uh, chapter 1, verse 2 through 8, I know this is a big pastor scripture, but I'll get through it. He says, my brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its 
perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So God's desire is that we as the body of Christ would lack nothing nothing, okay? If any of you lacks wisdom, wisdom, let him ask of God who gives all, gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a, the wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. So we have to make sure before we're getting ready to make a move that we're not unstable. We have to make sure of that. And you can take an inventory to make sure that you're in the right frame of mind. And this is the reason why we should not be anxious and impatient when it comes to a big decision. Now, there's something that's near and dear to my heart. One of them is uh, the, the body of Christ attitude and perspective when it comes to money. And the other is when it comes to marriage. Amen. We're going to talk about money here in a minute with old Ananias and Sapphira and how they allowed what something greed to enter into their heart and they made a bad move as well. But when it comes to marriage, sometimes we can get impatient with one another. Now, I thank God I've been married to my lovely bride for 32, 33, 35 years, somewhere up in there, we ain't even counting no more. See, we don't even count them anymore. You know why? Because we purposed in our hearts years ago Years ago, and I told many of you this story, she left me so many times, I would tell her, baby, just leave the keys under the mat. Just leave the key under the mat. Because it was a challenge for us to merge together and, and for her to learn how to, to deal with this. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? I didn't even know how to deal with it myself. I was just following my daddy. If T.O. did it and T.O. said it, then I caught it, and that's what I did. But it was once I got a relationship with Jesus Christ and began to let him come into my heart, then I can now begin to look at my wife and deal with my wife through the lens of God, through his righteousness, his right way of dealing with one another. And thanks be to God that she had godly women in her life, godly women in her life. She said, oh, baby, that didn't know him, but just pray for him. Get that oil and just anoint everything. <laughs> Wake up in the morning in the bed, got oil all on my forehead, <laughs> oil all on my clothes. <laughs> Trying to figure out where all this oil coming from. <laughs> she, she laying, she anointing my head with oil. She's calling those things that be not as if they are so. So I'm not supposed to be standing here. But for my wife, there go I. We know Jesus too. But if I didn't have a godly woman that was patient with me. And she still have to, have to operate with that patience. But here's the deal. So do I. So do I. But see, the enemy wants to tell us that you, you deserve better. Yeah, I know you went and got married and the wedding was all beautiful and you spent all that money to feed people that wasn't going to do nothing but analyze your wedding and your cake and your dress and all your stuff. And now here we are six months later and you're talking about divorce. See, me and my baby, we settled that years ago. We settled it. We settled it. I ain't going nowhere. She told me she leaving. I said, where are we going? Just oblivious. Just oblivious. I ain't going nowhere. I ain't even going out my bedroom. Mm -mm, never heard that right there. You need to sleep on the couch. No, I ain't gonna be none of that. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. Just boom. Put your little line there, but we're gonna be in the bed together. Sleep at the bottom end. <laughs> ain't going nowhere. I ain't going on no couch. No. Why? Because when you start uh, allowing that to come in, that's a gap. 
when really what both of you need to do is grab each other by the hand, even though you can't stand one another right now, and get on your knees before God and cry out to him and say, God, help us. And how many of those individuals are like, oh, I'm just looking for the right one, mm-hmm, the right one. Six foot three, blue eyes, mm -hmm, muscles, the perfect one. No, we want somebody that's saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, right? That have a biblical worldview of what marriage looks like. It doesn't mean things going to be perfect, but we're going to need Jesus if we're going to get through this thing. Y'all just clap when I said 32, 33 years, baby, like, oh, y'all just done something. No, that's Jesus. That is an example of Jesus working in our lives. And maybe there are some of you out there that you, you, you couldn't persevere and you couldn't endure through it. Doesn't mean that God's grace is not still available for us. So be patient with one another. Be patient. Be patient. Y'all shouldn't even be talking about, you should never talk about divorce, period, as the body of Christ. Yeah, settle it, right? and operate in forgiveness, a whole bunch of it. And if he acting up, then you can come. That's why you need to be a part of the men's ministry. Because see, in the men's ministry here at River of Life Church, we got some real men, some godly men, some kingdom men. So if he at home cutting up, acting a fool, acting like he, ain't, he don't know Jesus, just come on and slip me a note. You can slip James a note, you know, slip Pastor Chris a note. Intervention intervention we're working on this little room here right that we can go kidnap them you know we can kidnap them just tell us where where he gonna be at boom we we'll drive up on him on bojangles right get him tie him up bring him next thing you know he'll open his eyes and he'd be in a room dark room won't be able to see nobody how you treating your wife See, we heard you going on that computer at about three o'clock in the morning where everybody's sleeping. Mm, we heard that you won't talk to that gunny like that at work, but when you come home, you're talking about you the king of your castle, don't give you no hassle. And we can snatch her up too, y'all. S-A-L-E don't mean you spend all the money. See, that's confirmation bias there too. Just because it's on sale, that means it's for me. No, it's not. Leave it there. All right, and real quickly, how am I doing on time, y'all? Because I've been, am I good? Oh, yeah, 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 yes, good. And then let's talk about this one. So the first one was marriage. And I don't know, I don't know who I'm talking to. In a room this size, of course, we're having challenges, right? You might not be able to stand each other. But instead of trying to find the perfect one, how about trying to be the perfect one? Because see, it was through her example that when I was acting up and I came in, she just had this meekness about her. It wasn't weakness. Mm -mm. Now I know exactly what it was. That fear, fearless warrior princess spirit was all up in her. She had so much power, I didn't even fully understand it. But the way she could harness it, even in the midst of a painful situation, is nothing but God. All right. So as far as your relationships are concerned, be patient with one another. Mind your own business. And especially I'm talking to the body of Christ, especially if they're a born again believer. So you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You leave him and her up to God to perfect that work in them that he who has begun a good work, he's faithful to bring it to completion in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is not you. Not you. You can't do it. It's something about, you know, they say, I can't use that example. I won't do that. But, but, they, but, but the Holy Spirit, when he get on us, it sticks. Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. We have a story with Ananias and Sapphira. Y'all know the story about the husband and wife. And they decided that they would sell some land and they would bring the, 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 the proceeds from that land and that they would lay it at the feet of the apostles. Because back then, everybody sold what they had. They brought it together so that everyone would, that was in need would have what they needed. 
And the story tells us that Barnabas had done this. There was an example of an individual who had some land that maybe have inspired them to want to follow suit. So he had sold this land and he brought it and he laid it at the feet of the apostles. And then they decided, this couple decided that they would do the same thing. But then something entered into their heart, which tells us that their motives for doing it to begin with was a little twisted. Are you with me? It was their land. They made a decision to sell it. They made a decision in what they would bring and offer to the Lord, right? And lay at the apostles' feet. But guess what? They decided that they would deceive, try to deceive them by saying, we sold it for this, but we're only going to bring in this. And we know, here it says, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last, his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and they buried him. Now, what would happen? If in this building, you said that you would do something for the Lord, you know, like sign up on a list, say, I'll be there. From time to time, Pastor Chris will stand up here and say, I need this and I need that. And then they, you know, go sign up, right? And, 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 and we can't get it twisted that you're doing this for Pastor Chris. So you're doing this for the Lord. Pastor Chris is just a, a mouthpiece, right? So you get to control your own time. You get to control that margin. You get to establish how you're going to steward that margin. So be very careful that you don't roger up to do something or to give something or make a vow. And then you think it's just between you and this man or you and this woman when God is listening and hearing what you have purposed in your heart. But I think giving would go off the charts, even though here at River of Life Church, we're highly blessed and favored with the children of God, obeying God in their giving, very generous church. But what, it, what would it be like if we knew publicly that somebody said they would do something to God and they didn't do it and bam, they fell dead right there in, in the congregation? You wouldn't have a problem with that tithe then, would you? Oh, it's only a tenth. I mean, come on, I still have 90. Matter of fact, I'll just give the 90 and keep the 10. How about that? Are you with me? So this is just so that we could have some situational awareness because some of us believe that the, the reason why we're not prospering and we're not moving into the things of God because we don't keep our word. We don't keep our word. And God is not pleased with us when we do that. It says now it was about three hours later when his wife came in not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, mm, yes, for so much. That was a bad move, wasn't it? And then Peter said to her, now it is that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord. Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young man came in and found her dead and carried her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon the church and upon all who heard these things. So what does this mean to us? What does this mean? What it means is husbands and wives, wives, if you know, or husbands, if you know that you don't have to come into agreement with foolishness. You don't have to come into agreement. Again, I thank God for my bride that when I'm, you know, the hamster done fell off the wheel, right? That she'll be like, hey, wait, where you at? What you doing? Focus. Lock in. Do you realize what you're saying? Do you realize what you're thinking about doing? So we need those people in our lives. But here she agreed with her husband and she thought she was lying 
to the man of God when she was lying to the Holy Spirit. And as a result of that, they had to reap those uh, repercussions. Okay, so I want to leave you with this. We're going to roll into this as uh, just a couple of uh, questions to ask yourself when you're getting ready to make a move. Just a few questions. There are many, but ju- just, a, just a few. What does the word of God have to say about it? What does God's word have to say about it? Based on the situation that you're facing, does God's word have anything to say about it? We know that there are precepts and principles in the word of God that God has laid out. And there are some things that he said, just don't do. Don't do that. If you do that, if and then. So society and our culture, it has nothing to do with that. And in, the, in order for that to be true in your life, you have to make a decision and settle that the word of God is going to be the authoritative. That's going to be the authority in your life before you make a move. We have to go to the word of God. In Psalms 119 and 160, it says the entirety of Your word is truth in every one of your righteous judgments endure forever. Every one of your righteous judgments endure forever. So you'll hear people try to say that, oh, that was just for yesterday. That doesn't apply today. No, we let God's word be true and every man be a liar. Okay. the second question you can ask yourself is, will my decision bring glory to God? Will it bring glory to God? Because we know that as believers, that is our task. This is why when it comes to relationships, it's really not about your happiness. See, my wife was happy before I came into her life. (laughs) How about this? And so was I. Right? But we think in this happily ever after, we were fortunate to go visit this place over the summer and the theme was happily ever after. And I had my little moment like, oh, yes. Mm -hmm." No, but when it comes to relationships, no, I contribute to her happiness and she contributes to my happiness. But the devil would like to deceive us and think that we're responsible for each other's happiness. Therefore, if I'm not happy, it's got to be your fault. No, it's not. So let's get that untwisted. Let's ask God to realign that and we can have a conversation, but I, we contribute to one another's happiness. If you find your happiness in an individual, you're already set for failure and you have made a bad move. Okay. In first Corinthians chapter 10, 31, it says, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, do it to the glory of God. So in your marriage, You forgive to the glory of God. You endure to the glory of God, knowing that if you endure to the end, you will reap. You will reap if you do not faint, right? You're trying to see that this is a hopeless situation, but no, God can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. Are you with me? So in the situation that you're facing right now in your marriage is not just common to you. That's why you need to be connected with godly people that can come alongside you and say, let me train you on how to be a godly wife. Let me train you on how it is to be a godly man. We had a man, young Marine one time in one of the men's studies, he got orders to Hawaii, say Hawaii. Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Had a young wife with a little baby. And he said his sergeant, young Marine, said his sergeant came to him and asked him, uh, was he willing to go back to Iraq? And he jumped on it like, yes, he had orders to where? Mm -hmm. And a sergeant came to him and asked him, did he want to go back to Iraq? And he said, yes. When he came home and told his bride, he said, baby, you'll never believe what happened. You'll never believe what happened. I can go back to Iraq. And she said, what about Hawaii? He said, wait a minute. Hold on. Back it up. Put it in reverse. I mean, you know what you signed up for. I'm a Marine, the few, the proud. And she began to weep. All of these men, these kingdom men I was telling you about, it was all looking at each other like, who's going to get this one? <laughs> Here's the beautiful part about it. I forget who addressed it at that time that night, but this gentleman, he was young. He didn't know any better. He had drank the Kool-Aid, right? 
And when we explained this to him, he went out in the parking lot and he called his bride and he wept and he asked her to forgive him. See, that's what the body of Christ is supposed to be like. This is the reason why you need to be connected to real men and real women of God. So that when you're in error, we can give you, right, toss some things to you with the hope that you'll receive it and catch it. And then you go, see that, I, I wish I knew who that individual was because he'll be telling that story for the rest of his life. Because what he demonstrated to us is that he was available. He was willing to open his heart and receive correction. And it changed his attitude. The Marine Corps is going to get, they're going to get theirs. But you get orders to Hawaii. Come on, somebody. Mm -mm. She said, you can even go over there and be with the infantry. But, I, but I, you know, you do go do that jungle stuff. But I'm in Hawaii with a brand new baby. Come on, somebody. Man, this is a principle that we got to grab hold of. The next one is what godly counsel Will I seek before making this decision? What godly counsel? Oh, oh, whoa. Oh, will I? What godly counsel will I seek? I liken this to a board of directors. A board of directors. And we know that for organizations, they're required to have a board of directors. In the church, we have a board of elders. We have this board. And what is their purpose? Their purpose is to advise. And not anybody should be on that board. So you need to know who's on your board of directors of life. Because, see, I'm, I'm blessed and highly favored. God is sitting right at the head, Jesus Christ. He's right there sitting at the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit is there. But now when we come on this side of heaven, who's there? My wife is on my board of directors. Come on, somebody. I don't want just people that look like me and think like me on my board of directors. I need people on my board of directors that'll tell you that's about the stupidest thing I ever heard you say. Come on, somebody. I'm walking in a promotion right now today on my job because I was talking to one of my board members and I told him, I said, no, I'm not going to apply for that job, that promotion. I know I'm qualified and I know it's even in my heart to get it, but I'm not going to apply for it because, 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 because he said, Odell, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard you say. I mean, he told me that. And because of our relationship, I was still kind of apprehensive. He said, but you're going to apply for that job and you're going to get it. And what I thought would happen, it did happen. The reasons why I didn't want to apply, it, it did happen. But because of a faithful friend and somebody on my board of directors that felt comfortable to tell me, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard you say. I'm walking in something that I really did desire. Are you with me? So you have to have people in your life that can tell you, I have people before I make a big decision, starting with, with God, and then all of the relationships I have with our pastors. Pastor Chris, I don't have enough time to tell you how much of a blessing he's been in my life. If I gave you an opportunity to stand up and say, I went to Pastor Chris with my mind already made up that I was gonna do something, and he and Pastor Miriam said, they probably didn't say it like this, but this is what they said. That's a bad move. That's a bad move. And if I gave you time, you would be able to stand up and say, that's me. And because you were willing to receive what they said, even though you didn't understand it, today you're walking in the blessings of the Lord because you listen to godly counsel. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, people lose their way without wise leadership. This is the, the, the Passion Translation. People lose their way without wise leadership, but a nation succeeds and stands in victory when it has many good counselors to guide it. Or it could be said another way, there's success in a multitude of godly counsel. There's wisdom in a multitude of godly counsel. The next one is how will my decision impact the future of my family? How would it impact the future of my family? So your decision is not just going to affect you. The next one is, could my decision cause a brother or sister to stumble? And the last one is, is my mind already made up and I'm just seeking confirmation? Is your mind already made up and you're seeking confirmation? The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 5 wanted to go to Jerusalem. And all along the way, 
the people of God through the prophets prophesied to him, demonstrated for him. This is what's going to happen to the one that owns this, this rope, this cloak. But the apostle Paul had fixed his face towards Jerusalem and he was going to go. So sometimes as believers, we have our minds made up. And then when the brakes fall off or the thing fall off the tracks, we're saying, God, how did I miss you? So this is not about us not making decisions. This is just about us going through a process so that we are well informed. We count the costs. And we know that in the end we will have success. But some of us, where are we getting our information from? Is Google on your board of directors? The CEO from Facebook on your board of directors and Instagram and Twitter and everybody else? No, I'm sure there's good people out there, but no, I want godly men and women on my board of directors. I want to think about those elderly folks that are in in this congregation that are wise. They've already lived their life. They already know where the pitfalls are at. So why would we marginalize them and thank God we don't do that here at River of Life Church because we have river what? River wise, right? But I'm looking for the day that river wise just won't come together with themselves with all that wisdom on Saturday. You know, they got all the money in the church, right? So we know that. But we need to figure out how to get the river wise with the river foolish, right? And come bring them together. So guess what? And I thank God through the, through the moms, what's the little mom, mom's ministry? Encourage moms. Oh my God, talk to a lady this past week. She said, oh, the encourage moms. Mm-mm-mm-mm. It's just encouraging me. Are Yo, you with me? Ah, oh, catch that, catch that. And the last thing I'm going to say before we land the plane. Okay, we're going to land the plane. Sometimes we get a word of warning. I'll never forget when I first got to this church, the Holy Spirit told me to go to a brother and share with him that it was not time for them to leave Jacksonville. They had, he had set his face on another location and I went to him very apprehensively. I didn't want to do it and I took my wife with me. Like, Come on, babe, I got to do this. I tried to shake it. And when I got there to share with him, what I felt like the Lord had given me to tell him, he laughed in my face. He laughed in my face. And I ended it with this question. How does your wife feel about the decision you're about ready to make? A year later, I'm in my bathroom, remodeling my bathroom on a Saturday morning. My phone rang and it was like something like this. Hodel, you were right. I've been embarrassed to call you, but I just had to call and let you know that God truly did speak to you that day. Because since we left, everything has been going wrong. They moved to another city. They bought a house right before the market fell out of it. He couldn't find a job and had to literally leave that place and go to another state just to find work. So sometimes God will speak to you through someone else. And when somebody come to you and tell you what they're getting ready, you tell them what they're getting ready to do, and they say that's a bad move, you don't always necessarily have to understand and agree with it. The question is, will you trust God and that God have what's best in your best interest at heart? Okay. So what's the big deal here? With the decision that you're making, do you want to make a bad move or do you want to make a godly move? We want to make a godly move. We don't have to be tossed to and fro, right? Wandering around with no direction. But we can use the resources that God has placed in the body of Christ. And this is the reason why we should not forsake the assembling of the saints from coming together. And this is the reason why you shouldn't just show up and be a spectator. You should go through the process of going through a purple book in membership classes and then get connected to the church that as we're growing, as we're getting larger in number, we're working hard to get smaller so that we could have those intimate relationships so that you won't just show up on Sunday and walk out the door and you don't know anybody. Are you with me? We have to have, I I think about the elderly. I, I got a heart for the elderly. And I would just say for those of you that are out here today, 
and you fall in that demographic, you have so much value and worth. And I want to challenge you not to just sit on the, on the outside, but lean in. You pray and ask God, who does he want you to get connected with? And don't just wait for somebody to come and ask you to do something. You lean in. I think about, you know, Mama Lula would have been on my board of directors. Matter of fact, she, it ain't that she would have been, it's that she is. Because see, Mama Luda has so much influence in my life. You understand what I'm saying? That even those that have gone before us can still have influence on our lives. Come on, somebody. Mm, 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 mm. Ah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. If you would, close your eyes. And just lock in for a moment. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the word that you've given me for your people. And you know the decisions or the moves that we're faced with today. And you know each and every one of our attitudes and our position on it. But Father, I pray that through your Holy Spirit that you would do what only you can do. And and, and that is to, to help us shift our attitudes from a worldly perspective in a worldly view to a godly view in a godly perspective knowing that although we get to enjoy the things of life we don't attach our identity to that but for those of us that are here that are called by your name we're on purpose we're on mission and that is to make disciples to make disciples and that everything we do, we would do it to the glory of God. So for those relationships out here tonight that may be strained, Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Do in their life what you did in our life. And as they submit to one another, that they would do it for the glory and to the glory of God. And there may be some out here today that the move, the bad move that you've made The number one bad move is that you've heard the gospel of Jesus Christ preach over and over and over. And you know that the Holy Spirit is drawing you and drawing you and telling you that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you're going to make a decision for Jesus Christ. And week after week, you make a bad move and you get up. And you walk out the door thinking that tomorrow or the next moment is promised. I pray that today you would make a godly move, that you would accept this gift that he has laid before you, this gift of salvation, and that you would receive it by grace through faith. If that's you, just raise your hand and you would say, today is the day that I'm going to make a decision for Jesus Christ. Just raise your hand right where you are. I see that hand. Today is the day. There's some of you that may be feeling condemnation for all the bad moves that you've made. The Bible tells us that now, therefore, there's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. We don't have to keep repeating it over and over again. If you want to return to Jesus Christ because you know you've walked away from him and you started doing things your own way. And for some of you, the bad move has been forsaking the assembling of the saints. You haven't been coming together. For some of you, you're here because you've been told to be here. Today is your day. If that's you and you want to make a decision for Jesus Christ today, I want to invite you to just come on up here front. We'd love to pray uh, with you and for you. Everybody would please stand. I saw one hand. Would anybody come? Come on and encourage them in Jesus' name. Come on. This is the best move that you will ever make. It's making that move for Jesus Christ. Come on. Come on. Show him some love. 
the best move that you'll ever make is a decision for Jesus Christ. If there's two, there's got to be more. Come on, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to him as you are because he loves for you. He loves you. He cares for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can come on down here, sis, if you don't mind. All right. For the sake of time, if that's you, you better come on. You don't have to walk out of here today making a bad move. Anybody else? All right, well, congratulations on your decision to respond to what the Holy Spirit is doing in your heart. I just want to let you know that Jesus loves you. He'll never leave you, nor will he forsake you. And today will be the catalyst. Today will be a day that you'll be able to mark down. There's no need in holding your head down. You hold your head up because all of heaven is rejoicing for your decision. All right? All of heaven is rejoicing. All right? So they're going to join with me. The congregation is going to join with me in praying with you. And uh, then we're going to go ahead and transition, okay? You can pray with the congregation. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your sacrifice. And that while I was yet in sin, Christ, you died for me. That I would not perish but that I would have life and life abundantly. So today, today, I make a decision for Jesus Christ and open my heart and say, Lord, come in and be my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that I can do all that you've called me to do that will bring glory to your name forever and ever. Amen. Come on, give it up for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Congratulations.